There are a lot of videos online about how to use the Zoom L12 recorder and mixer, but very few of those are geared towards bands, especially louder bands that have drums, use amplifiers, and that are going to be miking their instruments. So this video is about how to use the Zoom L12 if you're in a band and you want to use it to practice, play a live show, or maybe record yourself practicing or playing a live show. Since you're here, you're probably already aware that the L12 is a unique device in that it can be used as a mixer for live performance, it can be used as a mixer in the studio while recording an album, and you can also use it as a field recorder if you're out somewhere where you're not connected to a computer but you still want to record yourself, and you do that using the SD card slot in the back. It can do a ton of other things, but those are our primary uses for it. So to start out, this is how we have the L12 set up in our space. We practice here and we shoot our videos here, so it's nice to keep the L12 close by so that if we need to make an adjustment, we can do so while still being connected to our instruments. Also, none of us are sound engineers. We all know a little bit, but it took a little bit of time to figure out exactly how to use this mixer for our purposes. If you're new to using a mixer, the best way to think about it is to visualize your instrument or microphone signal going into the input and then going straight down through the board. We're a four-piece band. We have two guitarists, a bassist, and a drummer, and three of us sing. Right now we have guitar one going into channel one, guitar two into channel two, all three of our vocal microphones going into three, four, and five, kick drum in six, snare drum in seven, the drum overhead mic in 8, bass guitar in 9, and then sometimes we use audio samples from old movies which our drummer turns on with her cell phone, and that is going into channel 10. Let's walk through the signal path of channel 1, which starts with my guitar. I plug my guitar into my pedal board with all of my effects, and then I go into my amp, which is a Vox AC30, and I have that mic'd up with an SM57. That signal comes in here and passes through all of these knobs and settings. So as far as inputs, you have 10 inputs in total. So basically 10 channels. 1 through 8 are XLR inputs. You can also plug in a quarter inch input to these as well. Inputs 9 and 10 are quarter inch only inputs. You'll notice that there are two quarter inch inputs in both 9 and 10 because these are meant for instruments with stereo outputs like keyboards and synthesizers. So it's not really a 12 input mixer, it's a 10 input mixer. You can plug in 10 mics or instruments, but two of those can accept a right and left signal. So that's why they say 9 slash 10 and 11 slash 12, but really it's 10 in total. One thing to keep in mind about channels 9 and 10 is since these are quarter inch only inputs and not XLR inputs, they won't have as strong of a signal as the XLR inputs will. Plugging something in like a keyboard into 9 or 10 should be just fine because a keyboard should output what you'll need to get a good signal. However, if you plug in a vocal mic or an amplifier mic or a drum mic into channels 9 or 10, you'll notice that the signal is really quiet and you'll want to use a DI box to amp up that signal. I'll talk a little more about that later because we had to do that with our bass guitar which is plugged into channel 9. All of these inputs send your signal through the board and out to six different outputs. All of those outputs are here along the top. Outputs are things you send your sound out to that allow someone else to hear it, such as PA speakers, computer monitor speakers, in-ear monitors, or even a set of headphones. Outputs and recordings are different things. It'll be clear as we move forward why it's important to make that distinction. So let's walk through the signal path to see all the different adjustments we can make before sending our sound to an output. As I showed you, my guitar goes into channel 1. The first thing my signal is going to hit is this 48 volt button. This is needed when you're using a microphone that needs to be powered. The SM57 I'm using on my amp does not need to be powered, but as you can see this button doesn't just affect channel 1, it's for channels 1 through 4. That said, none of the microphones we're using in channels 1 through 4 need to be powered, so we leave that off. 
That's an important thing to take note of. If you're using a microphone that needs to be powered, you have to turn on power for that whole section. Now, if you're also using a microphone that can't be powered, such as an old ribbon microphone, you'll wanna make sure it's placed in a different section on the mixer, otherwise you can wind up damaging the ribbon microphone. Most microphones that don't require power, like SM57s or SM58s, can have 48 volts turned on and it'll be just fine. It won't affect the sound or damage the microphone. Next is the high Z button. This works like a preamp if you're plugging a guitar or bass straight into the mixer without using an amplifier. It raises the impedance so that you can get a stronger signal. Only channels one and two have the high Z button. All others have pad buttons. Pad buttons are often turned on on the channels where you have your drum microphones. Drums are really loud. So turning on the pad button where you have the drums will actually cut a little bit of that signal so that you can get levels that aren't too loud. Back to channel one, since I have an amplifier and I'm not plugging my guitar straight into the mixer, I leave the high Z button off. Next is gain. This is the first thing you are going to set on each channel. You'll want to set it so that you're loud enough to get a strong signal, but not so loud that you're clipping. So you mostly want to see green, and you never want to see red, because red means it's too loud. Keep in mind that if you use guitar pedals, you'll want to set this level with your loudest and highest gain pedal turned on so that you don't start clipping your sound when you reach the heavier parts of your songs. Like I said about the pad button, when you're setting the gain for the channels where you have drums, you may notice that even with the gain knob all the way down, your drums might still be clipping. The pad button will fix that. Now we usually record our live videos with no one else in the room monitoring our sound. So we usually set our levels and then play our entire set. For that reason, we'll typically set our levels a little lower just so that if we really get into it and start playing harder, we don't run the risk of clipping our sound. Next up is the compression knob. We typically only use compression on vocals, so for all of our instruments, compression is turned all the way off. Be aware that compression will add a little bit of gain, so if you have set your gain right where you want it, but then you add compression, you could start clipping. So you'll need to find a balance between the gain and compression knobs if you want to add compression. Here's another important part that takes some getting used to. It's at this point in your signal flow, right after the compression knob, that your audio gets recorded. So whether you have an SD card in the back or you're plugged into a computer and you have your DAW software open, it's going to record the signal at this point. Nothing you do from here down will affect your recording. Everything from here down is all about adjusting for your outputs. That's why I say it's good to think about your outputs and your recordings differently. Next up is the select button where you can turn on effects and EQ each channel if you want to. So if you choose to add an effect, you click this button, you'll follow the blue section over to where you can add those effects and make adjustments. Our band doesn't use these effects, we mostly add our effects in post, but it's nice to know that we can if we need to. Again, none of these effects are applied to your recording, so if you really love the sound of one of these effects on your vocals, for example, you'll need to find another effect that you can add in post to hopefully get that same sound. Next is the record play button. You will need to push this button and make sure the light turns red if you want to record that channel. So when we are about to record, since we are using all 10 of our inputs, we have to arm every channel before we record. People have complained about this, but I like that when I'm by myself, if I want to practice, I can just record my guitar and my vocal mic. I can leave all other channels off so I don't wind up with eight empty tracks that recorded nothing. Once you arm each channel for recording, they do turn red, but you're not recording yet. You have to come down here, hit record, and then hit play. Again, you hit record and then play. Once you see the numbers moving, you're recording any channel that you have in red. Next up is the mute button. Again, this will only mute the sound of that channel in your outputs. You will not mute it in the recording. The other important thing is that the mute button is how you check your recording levels. So notice that if I want to see what my guitar record level is, I can hit mute, 
and notice that those green lights go a little dimmer. This is the level I'm recording at. So before you start recording, you'll want to hit the mute button to check your record levels on each channel. If you need to make an adjustment, you do so with the gain and compression knobs, not the faders down below. Finally, we're down to the faders. These faders adjust your output volumes on all six of your outputs. Over here, you decide which output you want to adjust by clicking one of these buttons. You have a master output and A, B, C, D, and E outputs. Let's first look at the master output. It sends a right and left signal out via XLR cables, which we use to go to our right and left PA speakers. This is probably how most bands will use the master output. On the A, B, C, D, and E outputs, you have quarter inch connections. The A output can send a right and left signal if you want to plug into something like right and left studio monitor speakers or some kind of interface that has a right and a left input, or you can just send a mono signal. The A output is the only one that gives you that option between a mono out or a right and a left out. And currently, we are not using our A output. B, C, D, and E are all mono outputs that we use for our in-ear monitors. Each letter is a different person in the band, and each person has their own in-ear mix, which I will show you how to create in a moment. Let's look at the fader settings for our outputs. I'll select the master output. Now, since we have our master out going to our PA speakers, and because our practice space is pretty small, we usually only send vocals and audio samples to our PA speakers because our amps and drums are loud enough that we don't need those coming through the PA as well. But if we were playing an outdoor show or someplace that didn't have a sound system, like a backyard show, we could use this mixer and our PA speakers, and we could turn up our amps and our drums in the master output if we needed. So that's how we're using the master output. Since nothing is plugged into the A output, if I adjust when selected on A, nothing happens. Now just to show you how the faders work, I did move these faders while selected on A, but that doesn't change my settings in the master output because these are not analog faders. So if I go back to the master, you can see by these lights that my levels are still the same. B, C, D, and E are our in-ear mixes. My in-ear mix is the D output. So if I hit D, you can see by the lights where my mix is set. I typically have my guitar turned up pretty loud. My vocals are in channel three and they're turned up the loudest. Everything else is lower so that I can hear them, but they're in the background. Now, if I wanted to hear more snare drum, for example, snare is in input seven. I can turn it up past where I currently have it. You'll see the light showing the previous setting turn off. Then I can adjust it for louder or quieter, whatever I want. That said, you won't see the light indicating your new level until you've gone to a different output and come back. So sometimes I'll go to the A output where we have nothing and then I'll go back and I can see my new setting. You'll always want to make sure you've selected the right output so that you don't crank up the snare in someone else's mix. One bit of advice, if you're all playing in the same room, you're probably going to get microphone bleed in your recordings, which means that the sounds from your drums and the sound from your amplifiers are going to bleed into your vocal microphones. It's normal. That said, one thing you can do to help decrease that is go easy on that compression knob. Adding more and more compression will drastically increase the amount of mic bleed you let in. Over here is the master volume fader that you can adjust to increase the overall volume going through the master output. We usually keep our set pretty low because if our gain knob is set correctly and our faders are set correctly, then we don't usually need to increase much with the master fader as well. It usually hangs out around the third light at the bottom. At this point, we know our record levels are good and we know that our master output levels are good. The last thing is to adjust any of our other outputs that we're using, for example, our in-ears. So if I'm the one making those adjustments, I'll go one by one, making sure I'm selected on the right in-ear mix, and each person can tell me what they want to hear more of or less of, and I'll make those adjustments using the faders. Singers typically want to hear their voice the loudest, followed by their own instrument, but everybody likes different things. 
Over here are the overall volume knobs for each in-ear mix, which will turn up everything in that person's in-ears. Most of us are set around 12 o'clock. Before I wrap this up, I want to talk about one challenge we encountered when we first got this mixer. We didn't know beforehand that channels 9 and 10 were going to have lower signal levels because they're quarter inch inputs and are essentially made for instruments with stereo outputs. We needed to have our bass going into channel 9 and our bassist has a similar setup to me. Her bass goes into her pedal board, then into her amp, which is an orange terror bass. We usually mic it up with an SM57, and we wanted to send that signal into channel 9 with an XLR to quarter inch cable. But we weren't getting a loud enough signal in the mixer, and if we cranked the bass up louder, it would eventually overpower everything else and probably wind up bleeding into all of our other microphones. I did a little research and found out that I needed to buy a DI box to amp up that bass signal so that we could get a usable level. Lucky for us, our drummer is married to a bassist and he happened to have an effects pedal that had a DI volume. So our bass signal now goes from her bass into her pedals, into her amp, out from her DI out on her bass amp, and into this pedal where we have the DI volume turned up, and then into the L12 and her levels come in great. So that's something to keep in mind. We were pretty naive when we first bought this mixer and didn't understand that we couldn't use channels 9 and 10 in the same way that we were using channels 1 through 8 without some kind of workaround. So if you're needing to put a non-stereo out instrument into channels 9 or 10, know that most quality DI boxes or effect pedals that have a DI volume control run anywhere from $100 to $400. If you're looking at dropping that kind of money, know that Zoom actually makes a larger version of this recorder and mixer, the Zoom L20, which has 16 XLR inputs and runs about $400 more than the Zoom L12. We've been using this mixer for a few months now, and honestly, it's been great for everything that we've needed it for. We have already had some conversations about upgrading to the Zoom L20, which will allow us to mic our bass amplifier and also give us more space for more drum microphones. But for everything we've needed so far, the L12 has been amazing. I'll wrap up by letting you hear some of our live music that we have recorded using this mixer. None of this has been professionally mixed. It's 100% done by us. Hopefully this video helps your band understand how to use the Zoom L12 mixer and recorder. If you want to hear more of our music or watch more live performances that we have done using this mixer, then check out the videos from our album live stream. I'll put some links below.